gleaming shell of an outworn lie, fable of right divine. You gained your crowns by heritage, but blood was the price of mine. The throne that I won by blood and sweat, by crom I will not sell, for promises of valleys filled with gold or threat of the halls of hell. So this week I'm covering Commands and Colors Ancients. It uh, was published in 2006 by GMT Games, and its designer was Richard Borg, uh, not to be confused with Richard Berg, the prolific designer of some older games. So I'm doing something a little different this week. Instead of going through some of the ancient battles that are used as scenarios that come with this game, what I'm going to do is use a fantasy battle based off of Robert Howard's Conan series. And specifically, there's a battle that occurs in the short story Black Colossus. Now, the reason I'm doing this is that it's a fantasy battle, and I can go ahead and comfortably include usage of all the different units in the game to kind of demonstrate what they do. A real quick overview of Robert Howard's Black Colossus. It involves an ancient wizard who was named Thugra Kotan, and he's awoken in his tomb by Shivatas, a Zamorian thief, who unfortunately doesn't survive the experience. And awakened, Thugra sets out on his plan of world domination, assuming the alias of, of Natok, the Veiled One. And he assembles an army of desert nomads and begins to conquer the Hyborian nations. Eventually, he runs up against the tiny kingdom of Karaja. It's ruled by the beautiful Yasmela. Using his magical powers, he glowers over her, and she decides that she has to fight back. So she travels the streets of her city and offers her kingdom's defense to the first man she meets. Now, who should that be but Conan the Sumerian? And Conan, who's in the army, is given full command over Karaja's royal military. Conan makes his way to the pass of Shamla, where he's going to confront Natok's horde, and there he arranges his forces into battle formations. As they're doing this, a mysterious fog begins to engulf the area, and they hear the sound of a large body of men thundering through the fog. In a really cool scene, the fog lifts and it reveals the huge army of Natok arrayed before them. Now, one of Conan's fellow leaders, Count Thespides, ignores Conan's suspicion over the apparently disorganized enemy, and he decides to charge his cavalry headlong into them. This is a trap, however, and the horsemen are all burned up by a magical dust that's been set up ahead of them. This almost routs Conan's army, but the barbarian stops this by smashing a would-be deserter in the face with a beef bone. Despite being pelted by arrows, Natok's troops eventually charge Conan's army. However, Conan is eventually able to stop the onslaught with a pincher movement, bolstered by the actions of a fellow nobleman, Amalric, and his cavalry, which find a pass through the western ridges and descend on the enemy from the rear. Although Conan's forces overall have suffered heavy losses, it eventually routs Natok's army. But as the army's routing around them, the mighty Prince Kudamon of Stygia meets Conan in the middle of the battlefield for single combat and almost overcomes him, but Conan eventually manages to stab him. Down but not out, Natok in a magical chariot rushes forward to kidnap Yasmela and eventually flees with her to some nearby ruins where he's confronted by Conan. Natok, re Natok reveals that he's the Lich King Thugra Kotan, risen from the dead, and he attempts to defeat Conan by throwing a snake at him, then a scorpion. However, Conan throws a sword through the heart of Natok, defeating the evil necromancer. Now, like all other Command and Colors games, the battlefield's divided into three sections by these two dotted lines, and these give each player a left flank, a center section, and a right flank section. And where the dotted line cuts through a hex, the hex is considered to be part of both the flank section and the center section. Each player has a hand of command cards, and these are used to determine what units can move or battle, and units can only take actions when they're given an order from a command card. There's also some battle dice, and each battle dice has six sides. There's a light green circle side, a medium blue triangle side, a heavy red square side, a leader, which is a helmet, a banner, which has a flag symbol, and then a cross sword symbol. Now you'll notice that each unit consists of a number of blocks, and these have to stay together throughout the game. In other words, they can move and battle together, but individual blocks can't move out on their own. Now, when a unit takes a loss, then a block is removed from the unit, and units cannot combine their blocks with other units. 
While the game has a very concrete set of rules, much of the premise of this game involves particular units modifying these rules. Thus, for every rule, there's almost always an exception. Now, the best way to learn these exceptions is to consult the unit reference sheet while you're playing. I'll kind of show that when I do the playthrough. Now, in my rules overview, I'm going to kind of keep with the basic rules and not go into a lot of exceptions with the units. And this is to keep this to a manageable length and prevent confusion to folks that are trying to learn the game. Now, the object of the game is to be the first to capture a set of victory banners, usually five or eight, and that depends on the scenario's victory conditions. And a victory banner is gained for each enemy leader or unit that's entirely eliminated. Now, there's a five-step sequence to each player's turn. The player plays a command card. They order the units and leaders based off of that command card. Then they make all their movements before they can battle. Battle or combat between the units must be fought to completion before another battle's begun, and then at the end of the player's turn they draw a new command card. Playing a command card will tell units what to do. It will always indicate in which section or sections of the battlefield you can issue the orders, and how many and what type of units and or leaders can, can be ordered. Now a leader in the same hex as a friendly unit is always considered attached to that unit. And if the unit's ordered to move, then that attached leader must move with the unit. And it still only costs one command to order a unit with an attached leader to move. Now as I mentioned before, units or leaders on a hex with a dotted line running through it can be ordered from either section. And if the command card allows you to issue more orders in a given section of the battlefield than you have units or leaders in that section, then those additional orders are lost. Now several cards will indicate that you order a number of units or equal to your side's command. And a player's command is equal to the number of command cards that that player's allowed to hold in the scenario setup. So if you're allowed a hand of five command cards, you can order five units. Now units always move one at a time, and all movement has to be completed before battles. And units can only move once per turn, and you can pass on movement, and you can move from one section of the battlefield to another. Now, aside from the special units, units cannot exit the battlefield, but leaders can evade or escape off the battlefield on their own side. Now, two units can never occupy the same hex. So when you're moving a unit, you cannot move onto or through a hex that's occupied by an enemy unit, an enemy leader, or even a friendly unit. However, you can enter a hex with an unaccompanied friendly leader. And if you do so, then that unit has to stop and the lone leader becomes attached to it. Like most other war games, terrain affects movement per the terrain effects chart. And note that each type of unit has different movement rules. And I always refer to the unit reference chart for this. For example, light infantry units, which are light infantry, light slings, light bows, can move one or two hexes in battle. While light cavalry and light bow cavalry units can move one to four hexes in battle. Now when moving alone, a leader can move up to three hexes per turn, and they can move through hexes occupied by friendly units and leaders. However, they cannot end movement in a hex already occupied by another friendly leader. And a leader in the same hex with a friendly unit at the start of the player's turn is said to be attached to that unit. And if the unit is ordered to move, the attached leader must move with it. Leaders can at any time detach from the unit and move on their own, but this costs one order to do so. Now, if units are within range of an enemy unit, they can battle with that unit. However, they don't have to, even if they are adjacent, and they can only battle one enemy unit during their battle phase. Now it's important to remember that the number of battle dice used in a battle is not related to the number of blocks in a unit. In other words, a unit with a single block fights with the same number of dice as a unit with four blocks. There are two types of combat. There's ranged and close combat. And units that can perform both must choose one of these two types. They can't do a ranged attack and then turn around in the same turn and do a close combat attack. Now, obviously, only units armed with missile weapons may engage in ranged combat. This occurs when a unit is battling an enemy that is more than one hex away. Like most war games, the enemy unit has to be within range and line of sight of the firing unit. Now it's important to remember that range combat cannot occur against an adjacent unit. In this case, the attacker would have to take close combat. And a unit adjacent to an enemy can also not fire at another more distant enemy unit. If it chooses to battle in this case, again, it has to battle close combat with the adjacent enemy unit. Also in this game, there's evasion rules, and a target may not evade a range combat attack. To perform the range combat, the player announces the firing unit and the unit that they're targeting. And these are always resolved one at a time, even if several ranged attacks are made at a single target. You check the range, and you consult the unit chart for the range of the firing unit. For instance, light infantry, light cavalry, and auxilia have a two-hex range. 
You then check your line of sight by drawing a line from the center of the firing unit to the center of the target unit. And if the line passes through any other units, both friend or foe, or blocking terrain, then the firing unit cannot attack. Note that if the line passes a blocking hex on the hex edge, that unit can fire, unless the obstructions are on both sides of the line, like in this example. Also note that terrain in the firing unit hex does not affect line of sight. Thus, you can fire out of a wooded hex, for example. The next step in the firing procedure is to determine the terrain battle dice reduction per the terrain effects chart, as certain types of terrain can protect target units. Thus, they reduce the number of dice that a firing unit can use to attack. You then resolve the battle. The number of dice are rolled depending upon whether the attacking unit held its position. In other words, did it move or not move before firing? And if the unit did not move prior to firing, it may use two dice in range combat. If it moved, it can only use one dice. You then score the hits. And the unit firing scores one hit for each dice symbol rolled that matches the unit type targeted. A dice with the green circle will score one hit on units with the green circle symbol. A blue triangle will score one hit on units with a blue triangle symbol. A red square will score one hit on units with a red square symbol. However, flags don't score any hits, but they can cause units to retreat. And a leader symbol or a cross sword symbol have no effect in missile combat though they do in close combat, so that's something that's often easy for beginners to forget. This final stage of fire combat is to apply any retreats, and we'll cover this when we talk about retreats. Close combat works much the same way, and a unit battling against an adjacent enemy unit is said to be in close combat with the enemy unit if it chooses to battle that unit. Procedures much the same as fire combat. The attacking player declares the combats that they're going to be involved in, and they resolve these one ordered unit at a time, in the sequence of their choice. Now all aspects of close combat, including momentum advances, bonus close combat, and opponent battle back, which we'll talk about, must be resolved before moving on to the next unit engaging in a turn's combat. And again, combat is only between a single attacking unit and a single defending unit. If several units choose to attack a single defender, they have to do it separately. The second stage is evasion. In certain situations, the defending units are eligible to move away from an attacker and avoid the combat, and we'll talk about that. You then determine your terrain battle dice reduction again, and then the attacker rolls the battle dice and applies the hits. Also, any retreats are applied at this time. If any units are forced to retreat, then the attacker can have a choice to make a momentum advance or also engage in another round of close combat. As in fire combat, in close combat, the unit attacking scores one hit for each die symbol roll that matches the target unit. However, unlike fire combat, one hit is scored in close combat for each sword symbol rolled. One hit is scored in close combat for each leader helmet rolled if a friendly leader is attached to or adjacent to the units battling, regardless of the type of units being attacked. And again, a flag does not score a hit, but it does cause the enemy unit to retreat. Now for each hit scored, a block's removed from the target unit, and when the last block of an opponent's unit is removed, then that unit's eliminated and the victor collects a victory banner. Now in close combat, the defending enemy unit can battle back against the attacking unit if one or more of the defending unit's blocks if they survived the close combat attack, and the defending unit did not retreat from its hack. And during the battle back, the previously defending unit rolls battle dice and applies hits and retreats in the same manner as the attacker did. Now retreats are resolved after all the hits on the unit have been resolved. And at, for each flag rolled against the target unit, the unit and any attached leaders have to move one movement back towards its side of the battlefield. And a movement is the maximum number of hexes a unit can move when given an order. Now the player controlling the retreating unit decides which hex the units retreat onto, but they have to use the following rules. First, the unit must always retreat towards its controlling player side of the board, and units can never retreat sideways. Also, terrain that's not impassable has no effect on retreat moves. Therefore, a retreating unit can move onto or through a forest, a fordable river, etc. without stopping. However, impassable terrain still blocks retreat. Third, a unit cannot retreat onto or through a hex already containing another unit, regardless if it's a friend or a foe. And fourth, a unit without an attached leader can retreat onto hexes that contain unattached friendly leaders, that is, leaders alone in a hex. However, the leader's immediately attached to that unit and the unit's retreat stops in the leader's hex and the unit ignores any additional retreat movement. Fifth, if a unit cannot retreat because its retreat path is blocked for some reason, then one block is removed from that unit. In some situations, a unit that's forced to retreat can bolster their morale. And a unit can disregard one flag when a leader is attached to that unit. And if the unit loses one or more blocks, then the leader must survive the leader casualty check for the unit to ignore this flag. 
Also, a unit can disregard one flag when supported by two friendly units or leaders, and support units can be in any two hexes that are adjacent to the unit. Now, the owning player may decide if they wish to accept a flag result, which occasionally has the advantage of taking the unit out of danger. Now, there's a few special actions that can be taken during combat. First is evasion, and when being attacked in close combat, the defender may announce the unit's going to evade instead of staying and fighting in close combat. Now, note that an attacking unit cannot evade if the defender battles back, and the attacking unit determines and rolls the proper number of close combat battle dice against the evading unit before it evades. But only symbols that match the evading unit will score a hit. All other unit symbols, leaders, swords, flags, etc. are ignored. So an evade is a movement of two hexes towards the unit's own side of the battlefield, and an evade mood of one hex is possible and permitted, but only if it's the only possible hex available. A unit cannot evade if both hexes towards its side of the battlefield are occupied by impassable terrain, units, again regardless of friend or foe, or a lone enemy leader. If the first hex a unit evades to includes a lone friendly leader, then the unit stops in that hex and the leader is attached to the unit. And now an evading unit may not battle back, even when it ends up in a hex that's adjacent to a unit making an attack. Now an attacking unit may not occupy the defender's original hex regardless of the result of the attacking unit's die roll on the evading unit. This is even true if the evading unit is eliminated by the attacker's die roll. So essentially evasion is a retreat in good order that prevents the attacker from advancing at a potential cost of taking some damage. A leader's evade movement is one, two, or three hexes back towards its own side of the battlefield. And when a leader is attached to a unit and the unit loses its last block by range combat or close combat, then a casualty check is made on the leader by rolling one die. And to score a hit on the leader, you need to roll one leader symbol. If the leader is not eliminated, the leader has to evade. And if this occurs in close combat, the attacking unit can take a momentum advance because it eliminated the defending unit. Now when a leader is alone in a hex and is attacked by range combat or close combat, the unit attacking the leader determines the normal number of battle dice to roll. And to score a hit and eliminate the unit, you need to roll one leader symbol. And if the leader is not eliminated, he must evade. And when a leader decides to evade, they have to follow certain rules. A evading leader may move through friendly units, friendly units with attached leaders, and friendly units alone in a hex, but they cannot stop movement on hexes with friendly leaders or impassable terrain. And after completing their move, if the leader's on the hex with a friendly unit, they're considered to attach to that unit. Now you can choose to evade your leader off your side of the battlefield, and this saves the leader from becoming a victory banner for your opponent, but you also lose the command piece by doing so. And if a leader cannot evade a minimum of one hex due to impassable terrain, then that leader's eliminated, and the opponent gains a victory banner. In addition to evading, leaders can try to escape. So if an enemy unit occupies one or two hexes of a leader's designated evade path, then the evading leader must attempt to escape through those hexes. To do this, you move the leader onto one of the enemy hexes, and you allow the enemy unit in the hex to battle the leader, and the attacking unit uses the normal number of close combat dice. And if the leader symbol is rolled, the le that leader is eliminated. Otherwise, the leader successfully escapes to the next hex. And if this hex is also occupied by an enemy, another close combat occurs. Now finally, if a leader is forced to move through a third enemy hex, they're eliminated. A momentum advance occurs when an ordered unit attacks in close combat, and they eliminate or force the defending enemy unit to retreat from the hex it occupies. Now the victorious attacking unit may advance into that vacated hex. That is a choice. And cavalry units have the option to make a momentum advance of two hexes. Now some units that make a momentum advantage, advance are eligible for a second close combat, and they can battle any enemy in an adjacent hex, and they're not required to attack the retreating unit, though they can if they choose. Now if the attacking unit is forced back, only cavalry units can advance. Also note that all units can only make one momentum advance per turn. We've talked about leader casualties a little bit. Just to try to bring it together, there are a number of situations where a leader casualty check has to be taken. Now when a leader is attached to a unit and the unit loses one or more blocks without being eliminated, there's a chance that that leader may be hit. To make a leader casualty check, you roll two dice. And if both dice result in the leader symbol, the leader's killed. When a leader is attached to a unit and the unit is entirely eliminated, you leave the leader alone in the hex. And the leader casualty check is made with only one dice. Now to hit the leader, you need to roll one leader symbol. And if the leader's not hit on this single roll, the leader has to evade. Okay, let me show you the reference chart here, and I think I'll just use this as an example, the warrior infantry units. Um, moving from uh, left to right, we can see that they are medium units. They're in blue or they're a triangle, and that means that when they're attacked, they're hit on a die roll that's a triangle, and they can either move one or two hexes 
we move on over to the fire range. They have no fire range. They're incapable of missile combat, and therefore the fire dice don't apply. Uh, on close combat, they can move one hex and attack for close combat, and at that point they use four die to make their attack with, or they can move two hexes and use three die to attack. However, if they move the two hexes and attack, it's kind of a charge situation where they have to make the attack. Now you'll notice the two little asterisks here. Uh, there's one by four and there's one by flag. Basically what this means is they can attack with the four dice for the close combat. However, after they take a combat loss, then they reduce down to three dice. Also, when they are attacked, they can ignore one flag while they are still at full strength, which means they have a lower chance of being forced to retreat. Now, since they're medium infantry units, they cannot evade. However, they can make a momentum advance in battle. Finally, for every flag that they do take, other than that special situation, they have to retreat two hexes. So, real quick review of certain types of units. Let's talk about leader units first. There are four major benefits to leader units. First of all, when they're attached to a unit and attacking in close combat, the leader symbol rolled count as a hit. However, remember this does not affect range combat. Second, if a unit is with an attached leader or in an hex adjacent to a lone leader, they can ignore one flag from an enemy attack. Third, they allow any foot units to which they're attached to make a bonus close combat attack after a momentum advance. I should have mentioned this when I was talking about uh, momentum advances. Cavalry can usually attack after a momentum advance. However, foot units often have to be a leader to do this. Finally, leaders are very valuable in, in aiding the activation of units with respect to certain command cards. Now, since elephant units act so differently than a lot of the other units, I thought I'd also cover those in a little more detail. Now, all elephants count as heavy mounted units, and they're composed of two large size blocks. And an elephant unit can move up to two hexes and then close combat. However, unlike other units, the pachyderms roll the same number of battle dice as the unit they're attacking would normally roll against them. In a few special situations, an elephant against an elephant rolls three dice, an elephant against a leader rolls one dice, an elephant against a warrior unit rolls three dice, an elephant against a heavy chariot unit rolls three dice, and an elephant against a camel unit rolls three dice. And leaders do not modify an elephant unit's close combat die, so in other words, helmets don't score hits, nor do leaders add any morale effects to the elephant. Now each sword symbol an elephant unit rolls in close combat scores one hit, and it's rolled again for an additional result. And an elephant unit ignores all sword hits rolled against it. Now when a cavalry or chariot unit is in close combat with an elephant unit, the elephant unit may ignore one red square hit and one flag. And if a cavalry or chariot unit is forced to retreat when in battle with an elephant unit, then it has to retreat one additional hex for each flag rolled by the elephant unit. Now one thing very specific about elephants is their ability to rampage. And if an elephant is forced to retreat, then it first rampages. And all units and any leaders who are alone in adjacent hexes, whether they be friend or foe, have to check to see if they're trampled. To do this, you roll two die for each adjacent hex with a unit or a lone leader. And a hit is scored when the symbol rolled matches that particular unit type. If a leader helmet is rolled, it will eliminate a lone leader. And if the leader's not hit on the rampage roll, then they must evade, and all other symbols are ignored. Now, after the rampage, the elephant completes its retreat movement, and if the retreat path of an elephant unit towards its own side of the battlefield is occupied by friendly units, enemy units, or a lone enemy leader, then the elephant is not moved back and it does not lose any blocks. Rather, the units or enemy leader that occupy the hexes of the retreat path each lose one block for each hex that, that the elephant is unable to fulfill in their retreat. A couple things about war machines. They can move one hex per activation, but they cannot move and battle in the same turn. However, if they do stay in the same position, they can battle an adjacent hex in close combat with two die. And they can't score a hit with a sword symbol during close combat. Now, if a war machine chooses to evade, evade combat, the attacker makes the normal attack roll. And if the war machine is eliminated, then they take a victory banner. However, if the war machine successfully evades, they're removed from the board for the rest of the game, as the crew of the war machine basically ran off. And the attacker does not get a victory banner for eliminating them. I'm a long ways from a master of this game. But I, there are a few strategies that I try to employ when I'm playing this. And I'd like to present about a half a dozen of them that you might consider when you're playing. First 
First of all, take your time. There's no in-game pressure to press an attack in the game, so take your time to build a winning hand of command cards and move units into cohesive groups where they can support each other from retreats. And while doing this, move range units forward to fire at their full range and soften up an opponent. Secondly, use light troops to their fullest. Now, light troops make up for their low die rolls with increased mobility. And note that there are more orders for light unit cards in the command deck than there are for heavy and medium units. Also, most of these have some sort of missile capability, and they can exercise that option, and they can also exercise the option to evade combat. And particularly, don't forget the uh, option to evade combat. Also, use your light troops to focus fire on elephants, camels, and chariots, because they should be able to soften them up before those three units wreak havoc in your lines. Speaking of lines, maintain thicker lines. The more units that you maintain in continuous lines, the more options you have for making massive attacks with a number of the command cards. And keep your leaders at the front so when their attacked units fall, the leader can retreat backwards and attach to another second row unit. However, remember that while long thin lines give you a broader front for attack, they can also have a tendency to be broken apart by lucky attacks. Now use terrain to your advantage, and remember that you can fire out of a lot of protective terrain while the enemy is going to have a harder time attacking you within those. Also make sure that your leader has a route of escape and friendly unit and a friendly unit to attach to. Leaders usually give you the edge in the battle, and lone leaders are extremely vulnerable. Also watch the order of your attacks. If you're meeting a line of enemy units, then place your units with leaders between two other units, and attack with the two outer units on the enemy units first, then use your leader to attack the enemy unit that's been the most weakened. This should cause that unit to retreat and you can move your leader forward and make a momentum attack on the other weakened enemy unit. Also always have a follow-up to a strong attack with your command cards. Now strong attacks can unravel if you aren't preparing one or two turns ahead and, so, and don't rely on the luck of the draw to follow through on a decisive attack. Command cards have three layers of flexibility. There's powerful cards with special conditions and these are followed by more general ones that allow you to move a certain troop type followed by your standard move two, three, four, left, right, center cards. Try to play your command cards in this order. In other words, the powerful ones with special conditions, followed by the general ones, followed by the standard moves. Also remember that it's advantageous to keep a flexible hand that lets you move at least one unit in each section. Even if your hand isn't ideal, you can at least make your opponent pay for a rash attack anywhere on the board by doing this. And don't keep the I am Spartacus, line command, clash of shields, darken the sky, or rally in your hand for too long. And while these cards are very powerful, they're also very opportunity or luck driven and they can often keep you from accumulating more flexible cards in your hand waiting for the right moment to play them. This is Command and Colors Ancients. Now what I've done is I've set up this uh, Conan uh, Battle of Shemesh game. The reason I went with a fantasy battle on this is because I think it allows you to use all the units that are available in the game kind of let you play around with those. Now whether I use these in this game or not is open to how the game plays out. But it'll let you use some chariots, it'll let you use elephants, it'll let you use these... Uh, I went ahead and used these um, uh, heavy war machines and so on and so on. And I also set it up so that the Natok, would, Natok and his horde would uh, have mostly light and medium units, while Conan would have heavy units. So that's the Karajan infantry. Uh, I'm starting the game with Conan having five cards and Natok having four cards. And when I drew the hand, Natok grew, drew a wonderful hand. He got two of these line command cards, which is a huge advantage, at least initially. So he can move almost his entire army, which is very rare. But he does have one less card to play with. And the other thing is that I let Natok go first to uh, simulate his sudden appearance of his the sudden appearance of his troops in the battle that's alluded to in Howard's story. Also, once per game, Natok can place a fire trap that does one damage to all units in a sector. And this acts as a turn. And it, you don't use a card for that. So I kind of threw that in. Um, I know it's kind of strange to do fantasy with this, but... Uh, you do have, I mean, there is Battle Lore, which is kind of the fantasy version of the Command and Color system. It's not quite the same. I don't think it has the same flavor that Ancients would have. So that's why I'm using Ancients in that. So again, there could be a lot of other battles that I could have done historically, but 
I mean, Command & Colors doesn't really do a really good job of simulating history. It's more just having a good time. Although, it's not. It's really none the worse than a lot of other Ancients-type war games. So, okay. Let's get uh, Natok going first. And let's pull him up here. And he's going to play this line command. And this issues to a block of foot units. They can move one hex... So essentially, I can move all of these foot units here, which is great. Uh, so I'll move one hex. And... Sorry, I'm a little out of breath. I just ran up and down the stairs here. So... Went up to grab my car and forgotten it, so that's kind of what happened. Uh, let's move this guy here, this guy here. Now I can only move foot. That's okay. And that guy. Okay. Discard that. Who can fire? Nobody can fire. Okay. Let's see what Conan. Everybody's out of range. So now Conan will go. I'm not sure. Now, elephants are the worst. I never know how to use elephants in this game. Um, I could counterattack. I think let's do counterattack. And that lets me do the same exact order as the opponent. Meaning I can move all of my foot units. So we'll do that. Oh, those are... And this is in a block. Can't move those guys. Okay. They can't move near as much, but that's okay. Uh, let's get that out of the way. Okay, Natok will go. And he draws a card. And the line command sounds like the thing to do again. I think I can do my line command. Hmm. Question is, could I do my line command... Move everybody in place and start firing. Or wait. Now, the one thing you can't do in this game is just sit on stuff. I guess you could you could order, like, three units and not move them. There's nothing that says that. Um, leadership, any section. Um, that's a unit and three adjacent linked hexes. Uh, that's that can move him and him, or it can move. Now I never know whether the adjacent hexes count as like this hex, this hex, and this hex. Does that count as three, or is it like these three that you have to move? I don't know. Um, let's use our three units on the left. We're gonna move this guy, this guy, and this guy, and that should keep our. That should keep our line together. So we will discard that. And... I think I want Conan to fall into my trap here. Let's see here. Okay, who is in range now? I always have to use the... Uh, I always have to use the charts. Even though I've played this dozens of times, I still have to use the charts. Um, one thing too is I play all the other, a lot of the other Command and Colors games, and it gets hard to remember what you do and which one. That's sometimes that's why I like Battle Cry, because it's so darn simple. But I think this is probably this game probably serves as the gold standard for Commands and Colors games, though. I think this is really the apex of quality in the game. It kind of hits that sweet spot between, say, Napoleonics and something simple like Battle Cry. Mm, that's good coffee. Okay, the Auxilia have a range of uh, two. They can't hit anybody. Light Sling can hit... Uh, they have a range of three. One, two, three. They can hit this medium. They get one die to do it, but that's okay. Cross sabers don't work with, not only is it light, but it's also an uh, arrow attack, so that doesn't work. And finally, these slingers can go. 
again with one die because they moved and that's a heavy so they don't hit either okay go to Conan Conan needs to draw a card leadership any section I think well I can't really charge darken the sky that's going to be a useless one order three units right okay maybe we could do something with that let's see what we can do let's get that chariot out there that's one two three we'll move the elephant hey i need to keep that open three you don't want to get you got to be careful and not bunch get too bunched up behind these guys that's always a problem okay now terrain he's on the uh, hills so maximum number of three dice uh let's see two dice into the hill three dice out of it so let's check what my chariot does well i just here we go chariots have a four during their first attack and he's going to attack here and so he gets actually did i say two die going in two die yeah so two die max leader and a medium so nothing there okay this guy can fight back and um since he's going to fight back with uh, light slingers have two die medium and heavy so he takes a hit and what was our he ordered three on the right okay discard that this guy can't do anything this guy can't do anything okay order heavy troops there we go that's going to help now um man what do i want to do here uh medium troops uh i've got a few medium troops that could be moving in which would be kind of helpful let's see here that's medium troops up to command so my command is four i could move four medium troops that's heavy i've only got two medium troops two units on the center i could order i think i'll do that okay so i move them forward and the light bow has a range of three uh, i think i'll go ahead and try to hit this heavy let me just uh discard that okay so the light bow I'm going to try to let's try the medium let's try to hit him first here um we're gonna let's see light bow he has one he can fire with gets across saber so nothing uh this guy is going and he gets one heavy so that doesn't do anything okay and then we can go with conan conan has got his five uh, order heavy troops that's what we want equal to command i think I, so heavies are gonna be one let's see what's his movement for a heavy calf heavy calf can move two and anybody else heavy nope that's it for oh heavy okay now does a calf count as a mounted unit that's always the other question i have i'm going to count it as a mounted unit so heavy chariot he can still attack uh i'm going to go ahead and charge it this way and we're going to attack right here Oh, drop my glasses. Okay, so he's got four. 
He gets a banner, banner, heavy banner. Okay, we were after that guy. So, banner, banner, heavy banner. We can ignore one banner because he's got two support ones. Uh, so we've got th two banners left. And that's going to be one. That's auxilias. Auxilias go back one, two. I could... Um, Heavy Chariot can advance. He can advance. One more. And I think I can end my advance with another battle. So we'll do that. We're going to advance towards this guy and do the same thing. Heavy Banner, Leader, Leader. So no leaders and a banner. Now he's got to go back one. Can't advance again. So... And nobody can attack back. That was Conan's turn. Conan. Whoops. Oh, let's get his cards. Okay. Now this is going to let me move. I will do double time. And issue an order to four or less foot units in a block. And they can move two hexes and engage in close combat. So... Want to go there. Um, there. There. And there. And they can engage in close combat. I guess that would probably be the one to go with. This is the only one that's going to do it. And he's going to go against this heavy cab. Uh, he is light. He gets a two. Banner and light. So that's so the banner will knock this guy back. Uh, heavy chariots go back two hexes retreats. One, two. Okie doke. Now we go with Conan. Conan has a what's he got? Order light troops. He doesn't have any light troops. Order two units center is leadership and two units those would get those would start to break up that line um, I could use the I could charge in here and try to break that line up or I could use the warriors I'm linking those warriors let's go with the leadership Oh, he just got a line command. Okay. So leadership any section. So he's going to move. Conan's here, and he can move adjacent. So we're going to have this guy charge. This guy charge. This guy charge. And this guy can move forward. Okay, now the warrior charges are a little sp specific here. So the warriors move. Now they can fire. They can attack with four dice if they're at full strength. And so we're going to do that. Oops, let's try it. Ah, that's three dice. Four dice. Okay, medium, medium, light, and banner. So he's on this guy. Uh, this guy's light, so we take the light into effect. He takes a hit for light. The banner can be ignored because there's a unit here and here. And this guy can fight back. So he fights back with a light bow. He's going to fight back with two die. Gets a medium and a light. Okay, so this takes, they take a hit. Okay. Conan goes, and I think, actually, I'm going to do the heavy cav and try to weaken this and then try to move down the line here. So heavy cav goes against the light slinger with four die, leader, ban, cross sabers, er, cross sabers, so light, 
no leader no leader so the banner's going to knock this guy back uh no he doesn't because he's got two on each side cross sabers will hit and a medium doesn't work okay so now this guy gets to actually fight back with two and gets a medium and a heavy so he takes a hit and now conan gets to go i will attack i will attack this light bowman here we've got a warrior so the warrior starts with four heavy a medium a light and a leader so he takes a damage for the leader because conan's with him he takes a light and heavy medium that's it now he gets to battle back with two again heavy and a banner and conan will suck up the banner and heavy doesn't affect him so discard okay now then line command that line command's looking pretty good i could probably go right along here and see if i think from nantok what i'm gonna do try to weaken this line go along this line and weaken it and then maybe try to hit him with that spell or you know the right no that's not going to do anything medium troops one doesn't help leadership that might work I, could, I was really kind of hoping i could get somebody moved into this position here well let's try that well i have a feeling these guys are going to break this line up somehow let's go ahead we're going to use our line command um now the block can move this guy again because this is all part of the same line. This guy can move one, one, one. Um, one. And that's going to be it for that one. This line's funny because it snakes around here. Um, one, 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 one. Okay. I think that'll work. It's a weird line, but it kind of works. Okay, let's put that here. Now then, everybody here can go if they can fight, if it's in range. So the light bowmen will start with them, and uh, they're going to fight with two. And they get a light and a crossed sabers. Crossed sabers doesn't work with the light bowman, so nothing there. Uh, this guy will go against Conan. Gets a crossed sabers, which doesn't do anything, and a light, which doesn't do anything. Oh, this guy gets, the, the, I forgot, these warriors get a fight back. And they get three die, since he's not at full strength. Crossed sabers, crossed sabers, and banner, so this guy's gone. Okay, this guy went against Conan. Now Conan goes with four. Leader, medium, leader, and a banner. Banner, there's two adjacent, so the banner doesn't do anything, but the two leaders do. Takes a hit and takes a hit. Okay, this guy's going against this heavy cav. And with two banner and a crossed sabers. Cross Saber doesn't do anything the banner will, though. And that's going to make this guy back, too. Um, he can move in, but he can't... He, and now, if he was, had a leader with him, he could move in here and then attack Conan again as an advance. Okay, this Light Bow against this Heavy Cavalry. Uh, light Bow is two, and I got a Cross Sabers and a leader, so nothing. This guy here, Heavy and a Medium. That's going to give him take a hit. Auxilia have a range of two, so nothing nothing there I can hit. And that is it. Okay. Kind of broke my line apart, but that's okay. Let's go with Mr. Conan. Now he's got the line command, but and we still have a pretty good line here. Let's do that. Okay, and we are going to try to get this whole line here to, to do their thing. 
So we'll start here, 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 and here. Okay, now these guys are not part of the line, but these guys are. So we start with the heavy cab against this um, light slinger. And heavy cab have four die. Okay. Nothing. My gosh, they're just not doing anything. So this uh, slingers get to go. Banner and a medium. So banner won't do anything because this guy's got a guy here and a guy here. Okay, heavy cab here with four. Cross sabers, heavy, heavy, two cross sabers. So take a hit and take a hit. Okay, this slinger's gonna fight back with a leader and a ban. So ban will send this guy back two. This heavy cavalry will go against those bowmen. Uh, cross saber and a two leader, so takes a hit. Bowmen get to go back. Cross sabers, nothing, and a light, nothing. Okay, medium here. Let's see, mediums fight with four. And two cross sabers. So take a hit and take a hit. Boy, nobody's rolling lights. Okay, these lights get to go. And uh, they roll back with two with a heavy and a light. So that's nothing. Finally, this chariot gets to go. Uh, crossed sabers. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to say this guy is going to try to evade. And when you evade, you go back. You have to go back two, I think. Actually, I can't. I don't have a don't have any room to invade, evade. So, I'm just going to have to suck it up. Uh, let's go through. Cross sabers, a light, a medium, and a banner. So he takes a hit and takes a hit. And the banner sends him back one. We'll move, which we can do. And we can hit him again. And that's enough to, let's see, two of those cross sabers. So that takes him out of commission. Okay. And that was Conan's move. Okay, we go to Nantok's move. Kind of running out of options here. <laughs> use that three units on the left. And the auxilia will go. Okay, so medium calf can go first, and they have three die. Cross sabers, heavy, and medium. So medium calf. And I think medium calf can use, yeah, medium calf can, that's going to be enough. Let's see, that cross sabers is going to work against him here. And so that's it. And he can do inputs. And then this auxilia is going to go. Now he's moved, so he just gets a, oh, he's doing a uh, close combat with three heavy, heavy and cross sabers. So that's going to, Get a hit here. Now these medium can move back though with four. And the cross sabers will hit him. Okay. We go with Conan. Back to Conan. I like the idea of the flank attack. Because I can use my warriors. Uh, and then this, let's do that. Let's, okay. This guy here is pretty good. Let's get our elephants and go in here. Let's try to get the elephants. They can move two. And then this medium will attack this auxilia. And with four die, 
banner is ignored, the medium is ignored, the leader is ignored. Okay, nothing. Oh, I should have moved here. And then over here we'll move, and here we'll move. Okay, this guy moves one and against the auxilia. And they uh, warriors close combat with three. Cross saber, leader and leader, so that takes a hit. The auxilia battles back with three. Okay, the banner and a cross sabers. The cross sabers will hit. Uh, light doesn't, but then the banner will. And the warriors move back one, I think. Two. They move back two. Okay. Okay, Conan's group goes with four. Banner, banner, light, and heavy. Okay, that's enough to take this guy out. And Conan moves down one. He can do it again with four. And I'm going against uh, this guy. Light, leader, medium, light. So two lights will take this guy out. Take hit. Take hit. Okay, we got Conan needs two more. I should have had that guy try to evade, but that's okay. Now, Natok's going to go. And at this point, I think Natok's going to throw his spell. We're just going to do that. So basically, Natok is going to throw the spell over... Let's see. Well, that warrior's doing some... Warrior's going to do the center. So one... Two, three, four, six, and this guy. Everybody takes that fire spell. Even the camels back here. Okay. And that's my that's it for that turn. Okay. Now Conan goes. And um gonna move my elephants up. Nope, I forgot to discard that one. Yeah, we'll just do... I, I'll use... I want to try to use the elephants here. Uh, we'll move one and this medium guy here. Okay. So to do an elephant attack, you're going to go and elephants are going to... They, they do whatever you're up against. So, um... Medium cav. I think we're going to go against the medium cav... And since medium cav fight with a three, well, the elephant will fight with a three. Oops. Medium, banner, and medium. Okay. Take hit. Take hit. And then since it's an elephant, I think um, Medium cavalry retreat one additional hex per flag when battling an elephant. So now if if he wouldn't have this guy here and this guy here, he would have had to go back at least three instead of two. Normally they would go oh, they would retreat three hexes. They would retreat four since it was an elephant. So one, two, three, and then they take another hit. That would actually eliminate him. But he does have support, so that didn't work. And he can battle back. Medium, medium, and leader. So nothing. I was hoping the elephant would run amok. That's what's really fun. Is, And I've had it where you've had an elephant running amok, causing another elephant to run amok, and it's a mess. Elephants aren't worth it in this game. I don't know. The elephants, chariots, and camel units are just kind of a mess. So, okay, let's go ahead and discard that card and get a new one. Okay, Natok gets to go again. Oh, I hate that medium one. And I never know whether it's worth it to throw away a card or not. Or keep it in your hand. Um, leadership, any section. I think that's what we'll use. Cards are getting... That's the other thing about this game that's kind of cool is as you go, cards get worse. Your hand gets worse and worse and worse. Um, let's see. He's got leadership, so he can move... These guys here. Let's try to get that elephant out of here. With this guy, this guy, and 
you know, like I say, if I knew that it was three adjacent, whether it was a block or whether it's actually I have to be an adjacent oh. Okay, medium cav will go against the elephant first. And three die. Medium, heavy, and heavy. So the elephant takes two hits. So the pachyderm is sent pachyderming. He moves in, and he can actually make another attack. Cross sabers, light, and leader. Okay, so he can use that to hit him. Now this guy, Auxilia, can go, and he has three. In close combat, heavy, light, and cross sabers. Takes another hit and sends him back. And Exilia can move. And he cannot battle. He can only advance. So that's okay. Okay, Conan. It's going down. It's getting pretty close. Has no light. Just like the medium. Man, if we could change this card out. Three units in the center. Sounds good. Leadership any section. That's... Now, Almeric over here, he could he could try to move through the valley just like he did in the book. I've got Darkened Sky doesn't do me much good. Order two units leadership or order three units. Um, going to have to use that card. Hopefully I can get two units cleared. So three units in the center can go. So we want to use this one. I'll use the heavy cab and I'll use this heavy cab. Wait. Yeah, I can't use the heavy heavy. That would be nice. I could use that five pointer. Okay. Yeah, if I could get Conan with a five point guy here, that would be wonderful, but that's not going to happen. Okay, let's start here with this guy going against this guy. And uh, this heavy cav, hopefully they won't battle back. A battle back will wipe me out here. Um, heavy cav has four. And on this guy, I've got a leader, a medium, a heavy, and heavy. Oh, that's going to hurt. So no lights. So the guy fights back with two light and light. Okay. Dodged a bullet here. We're going to go here with four. Medium, medium, light, and leader. So there's a takes a hit for the... Uh, Light, but gets to fight back. Light and light. Okay. And then Conan goes with his warriors. Now they've got three now. Because they're not full strength. Heavy, banner, and a medium. So the medi that will send this guy back two hexes. Conan can, uh, Conan can go ahead and go again. And he's going to step in here, and this Exilia with three, Banner, Leader, and a Light. Okay, so the Light and the Leader give a hit. One hit, two hits, and then Exilia go back, or well, retreat only one. That's the nice thing about them. So. Okay, and he can't go again. Okay, we're up to Natok. His four, um... Two units on the right or two units on the left? Okay, Natok. Uh, or Katum, Kutuma, or Kutuman could go. One, two, three. That would be interesting. Okay, let's try that. One, two. Cav, let's see, hold on a second. Light Cav fight with two, and then this guy fights with two. Okay, so it doesn't make a difference. I was going to move that Light Cav into place, but that's okay. Um, okay, we're going to try to hit that Warrior unit. Inspired. Oh, that was not, that was Inspired Left Leadership, and I'm not on the left. That was, I thought it was right. Okay. Sorry, guys, move back. We'll do the okay. We're gonna order two units on the right. One, two. Okay. We'll discard that. Oh, that's gonna help. Okay, Kudaman's gonna go with the heavy cav or the heavy chariot. 
Attacks with a four. Light, heavy, medium, medium. Okay, so two mediums. Takes hit. And let's see. And takes hit. And then a light, heavy. Okay, so nothing else, but we got to see if Conan. We roll two, and if it's two liters, then Conan's gone. Oh, okay. Uh, these guys get to fight back. And uh, with uh, three. Heavy, cross sabers, and light. Okay, so that's two. They take a hit. They take a hit. So they're gone. Now, Kudamon has to uh, see if he can survive. We get one hit, and if it's a leader, he's gone. Nope, he's not, so he sneaks off. Now then the light gets to go. And I don't know whether, I guess if more than one attack is made against a unit, good question is, can they attack back? I guess they can attack back as many times as they're attacked. Um, okay, the light gets to go with two... Heavy and a banner. Okay, banner is ignored. And then Conan's, uh, his guy gets to fight back, his warriors. And let's see, the warriors are fighting back with three. Banner, a medium, and a light. So the light takes a hit. The banner means two back. And it's, he can't advance on a battle back. Okay. And that was that was Natok's turn. Okay, Conan's turn. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, inspired leadership any session. Oh man, this guy's really running out of steam here. What we're gonna do. I'm going to move Conan. We're going to use this Inspired Center leadership. For Link Texas. Okay, these are adjacent Link Texas. I think they have to be adjacent and Link, so I think they'll work. So we will... I think I'm going to move this guy back. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll do that. We'll move this one back, too. Uh, it doesn't really let me use them all, but that's okay. And Conan will go against this guy, because that would win the game. Uh, we will go um, this heavy cav with four. And we get a banner, banner, heavy, and a cross sabers. So first of all, we'll take the cross sabers. And then the light bow goes back two, and we have two banners, so they have to go back four, one, two, three, and then they'll take a hit for four, and that will end the game. We'll get our, that's our six, so. Okay, well, we didn't get the chariots really going, we didn't get the camels in, we did have an elephant, but we didn't get them going crazy. We got the warriors in, those are the ones, and we didn't get this poor old, uh, guy up here, which is able to shoot six hexes. We should have put him up in the front somewhere, but that's okay. Anyway, that's what I got. Like I say, I think this is probably, of the commands and colors, this is probably the best. If I were going to rate them, I'd say probably this. I like Battlelore quite a bit, and Memoir 44 is kind of silly, but it's kind of fun. It's, it's the one that I can always get to the table with people, particularly new people that really enjoy playing with the army men. Uh, the medium ones, I'd say probably the Civil War one, uh, Battle Cry, uh, the American Revolution one, which I did earlier, isn't too bad. I kind of it's kind of fun in its own way. It's a little more complex. Uh, probably the the one from Japan is, is is okay. I think it's okay. And the Napoleonics one, it's probably the most complex. I haven't quite mastered it. Uh, on the Commands and Colors games, that probably my lesser favorites the science fiction one was a red alert it's, it's okay the medieval one is is interesting but i don't think it's any better than like this one i think it's got some pro a few problems 
plus the expectation. I think most people didn't have the expectation that it would be more uh, War of the Roses and uh, the um, Hundred Year War and the Crusades. And instead it focuses on the Byzantine warfare, which, which is kind of neat because it's a little bit off the beaten path. But like I say, it's a little bit disappointing for folks that want to play more high middle age kind of stuff. Uh, the World War One one is probably the only one that I've played that I probably wouldn't really want to play again too badly. So anyway, that's what I've got. Like I say, I'm not an expert at Commands and Colors, and if you're watching this and you're, you've played a lot of this, I apologize for anything that uh, went wrong with this, but uh, it's a fun game. I Like I say, I like to get it out and play it about once every six months and get it on the table, and even I can get my wife, who doesn't war game, to play this, which is kind of cool. Anyway, that's what I got this week. I sure appreciate you guys watching, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.